Hey, Pastor Tyler here. We are excited that you have found us online and want to thank you for taking the time to listen in on one of our Sunday morning services. Whether you have already heard this message live or are just finding out about us for the very first time, it is our prayer that God will use this message to radically impact your life. At the end of this message, I would like to share one more thing with you, so please take time to listen in until the end. Now, here is a message recorded live from Connection Point Church. I hope you enjoy. I, uh, I want to welcome you back for part two of our, um, I guess, our Christmas season series. Uh, we've got um, Christmas Culture. Christmas Culture is, is the name of our series. And I just, I'll, I'll just tell you right now that we have a, uh, Christmas is on a day. Everybody, everybody in here got a birthday. I know y'all got birthdays, okay? Your birthday is on a day, right? Christmas Day is on a day. But isn't it crazy how Christmas, we make like a whole season out of it? I mean, it's like... It's like a weather, I mean, like you got fall, winter, you've got spring, I'm trying to remember the other one, the summer, and then you got Christmas season, you know, it's kind of like it goes right, it's like our fifth, you know, element there of, of seasonal uh, engagement, and, and we start Black Friday, you know, shopping, go crazy, getting, looking for all the deals for the Christmas presents going under the tree, and all this exciting stuff that's happening and going on, and uh, you start hanging up lights, and uh, some of y'all go and you cut you down a Christmas tree, and you huck it all the way back home like you would a, hunting a deer, and uh, you, you get home, and you clean up all the pedals, you, you hone it in, or some of y'all like me go to Lowe's where they do all that for you on these like horses, they just like, like I'll take that, I go home, like I got me a real tree from Lowe's um anyway and then some of you guys are like no I got the fake tree I'm eco-friendly and I got this thing that's been like 20 years old and some of y'all are buying these $500 trees that got lights already up in them and I'm just like man they got real ones out in the woods for that so anyway so anyway um you got the Christmas tree thing going on you got the decorations you're going to take out some of your fall decorations and you're going to go all red and green and I'm not really sure how Christmas like adapted to the red and green anybody know where that came from just like red and green shebang like go and stop all at the same time i don't know <laughs> it's like it's like it's it's a season of red and green and um maybe it's the blood of jesus and we gotta go to him <laughs> i don't know i just made that up um but anyway so so christmas season it's just i don't know like you hear christmas caroling i mean ain't nobody showing up at the nursing home singing nine months ten months out of the year until christmas is time and then everybody's singing to the old folks in the nursing homes or at the at the at your front steps i mean how often do you have somebody come to your front steps start singing your songs like we should we should do like in july just show up at somebody's house knock on their door and sing worship songs like amazing grace be like What are y'all here for? (laughs) Like, it's just weird. It doesn't make any sense. Our culture permits it one month a year to randomly knock on a stranger's door when it's dark outside to sing at them in their front yard. It's actually pretty awesome. Um, Hanging ornaments on a Christmas tree. Your kids are coming home with all these, like, big marshmallow or uh, cotton ball Santa Claus faces. And uh, you got, you know, the fight over, you say Merry Christmas. No, we say Happy Holidays. You can say whatever you want to. I don't care. Holy Days, Christmas Day, it's the same thing to me. Um, Um, So anyway, anyway, Christmas culture, it's painted for a whole month, month and a half. But along with the Christmas culture of all the decoration and all the visual, and it's really, really easy to tell that it's Christmas in most people's lives in our community. But there's some other things that come along with that too. There is, um, well, it's it's a national rating that uh, depressive medicines are more prescribed in the month of December and January than in any other month in the entire year. Um, you've got a lot of people who are struggling with loss uh, at a time when it's supposed to be about family and friends and community and, and all that kind of stuff. You've got broken relationships and you've got a lot of debt. You've got a lot of bad decisions that come into this because we enter into a season where we kind of hear and know about God and we know that it's about Jesus, but all of our life actions are like really not displaying that it's all about Jesus. So we begin to make decisions based on what we think would make other people happy. Other people are making decisions on based on what they think that would make us happy. So we kind of get it wrong with the gift giving thing and the stresses, the obligations, the traveling. There's just a lot of things that come with our Christmas culture that I don't think God ever had intended for us to really endure, embrace, or to deal with. So what I've kind of done, I actually thought I was rolling into a three-part series, which is funny. Uh, Brother Brian, uh, Pastor Brian, he he reminded me last week. He said, man, where are you getting the third part at? I'm like, dude, I'm cramming two of them into one this week. I'm just going to knock it out of the park. But, uh, But it's actually kind of comical. Last week, we really dealt with the simple fact that there are a lot of, um, 
I call them joy suckers. And I'm not talking about the kinds you put in your mouth and, you know, taste like cherry. I'm talking about joy suckers. There's a lot of things in our lives that suck the joy right out of us when it comes to Christmas time, when it comes to family time. Um, some of y'all got that one person in your family that just seems to suck the joy out of everybody. You got that one person at work or that one person uh, at church uh, who's raising his hand right now. Uh, no, I'm just playing. Um, you, got, you got people that just want to suck the life out of you, not intentionally, but they just do. You also have a lot of circumstances, a lot of situations that come up around the holidays, around Christmas time, that seem to suck the joy out of you. So last week we addressed uh, six uh, ways that we can build our joy. And if you missed that out, go to www.connectionpoint4letteru.com and you can check out that message and, and, and get caught up with us. It was, uh, it was a very good message. Um, I'll just tell you right now that as I enter into the Christmas season uh, and I'm digging in the Word, man, I'm telling you, God is really, really shaping and molding my character. So today, I just, I'm just i going to be completely honest with you. I'm entering into this Christmas season heavy burdened myself, for me. So while I'm up here and I'm preaching at you about what, what we ought to be doing or what God is telling us to do or giving us direction, I want you to know that this is very personal for me. Today is, uh, uh, is, a, is a walk down a personal lane. Like I'm um, I'm, I'm carrying some weight. Uh, this morning, uh, we, we pray. We pray for all of y'all every Sunday morning before you even get here, just so you know that. And uh, in our prayer time, I just kind of brought up um, in our circle. I'm like, you know, every one of us is carrying some kind of a weight, one way or the other. Every, everybody's got some kind of baggage that you're carrying in here today. Uh, why don't you just throw out one thing that's, you know, weighing you down the most? So what I want you to do right now, just in your own minds, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and shout it out, uh, but begin to, begin to bring to the surface. What are the things that have caused the most weight in the last month, the last couple months, maybe, maybe today. Today, you're showing up here today, and there is, you, you know what it is. You can put your finger right on it. The, the weight that has, has you heavy, maybe there's not much weight for you. Maybe it's thinking ahead of the things that are going to come that bring a little bit of weight to you. Whatever, whatever that is, I just want you to bring it to the surface of the forefront of your thoughts. And uh, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer today, and then I'm going to jump right on into today's message, okay? Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to ask you in Jesus' name that you would show up here today and that you would not necessarily remove our burdens from us, uh, but that you would alleviate the weight because we would acknowledge that you are with us, that you are in our presence, that you are in our midst, that you tell us you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, you have never left us, that you've always been guiding, you've always been leading, you've always been trying to reveal yourself, just sometimes we muddy the waters and don't see it very clearly. So Father, I pray that this Christmas, our desire and our wants for this Christmas wouldn't be something that we'd put on a list, but it'd be something in our hearts, and that's you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All I want for Christmas, all I want for Christmas is you. Not really. <laughs> all I want for Christmas, uh, you, everybody has a, well, I want to say everybody. Uh, a lot of kids have a Christmas list of things that they, they just start going to town. Oh, man, I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want this. And we think that all these things are going to bring this great amount of happiness, and they're going to tend to a need, and we're going to be so fulfilled because we have this one item. Oh, I want the big item on my list. I want the big item. That's what I want. I want, I want that one golden glove. of th- I can honestly think back in my childhood of all the things that I actually got as a child. I don't even have or use now. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's so many things. Like, I outgrew my underwear from, like, you know, 20 years ago. So I don't I, I definitely don't have those. Um, there, there's all kinds of toys and different things that, like, for a season, it was really, really cool. Like, I was a big G.I. Joe fan, man. When I was a kid, I was like, I wanted every G.I. Joe in the store. And I'm pretty sure at one point or another, I had them. But there came a point where the G.I. Joes got old. Okay, maybe I did. But anyway, uh, the point is that, that I mean, they're, they're not still with me. I mean, I don't keep them in my toy box or anything. I got other things in my toy boxes, like tools and stuff that break stuff and hammers and, you know, whatever. But, uh, but anyway, um, we put those things on our list, and all we want for Christmas is... And you know what? It is so easy. It is so easy for each and every one of us. I don't care if you're sitting here today and you're a non-believer and you're struggling with the whole faith thing, or, or if you're sitting here and you're, you're a believer and you, just, you know that Christmas is about Christ, but it's really, really easy for us to forget what God has done. It is. On a day-to-day walk, it, it, is, it is easy to forget that God has actually even done something. That as we enter into the season, there's, there's a, a recognition of, hey, what is this all about? What, what's going on? We're hearing the stories, and you know, God has, has stepped into time has stepped into our time and walked with us, and he gave us a baby, and his name was Jesus. He stepped into the window of time where we desperately needed 
him the most and he gave us his son and it was baby jesus what we need now more than anything else and it has never changed whether you're a christ follower or you're not is that we desperately need jesus and all i should want for christmas is christ in my life i want to steer you to a very familiar passage in matthew chapter one Um, this is something that even if you haven't had much church experience or if you've been around the church realm for quite some time this is something that you will have heard one time or another whether it be on tv or or in the telling of the christmas story or or whatnot this is this is a very familiar passage and i want to walk you through matthew 1 um i'm going to probably take up at 18 and i'll end at 23 if you have a bible you feel free to turn if not i'll i'll put it up on the board here and uh and you can you can follow along with me Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 says this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant, uh oh, through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is, conce- what, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Shoo! <laughs> Joseph's freaking out. Um, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Verse 23, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel. Emmanuel means, it it defines the force right there in the scripture, God with us. We find ourselves so familiar with this story They were like, I know Emmanuel means God with us. I've heard that before. We know the story. We know that a virgin ends up pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph's freaking out. Doesn't know how this is all going to come to pass. But here, here we are. We're listening to this and we're oh so familiar with it. And I think because we are oh so familiar with it that we are numb to the weight behind what this actually means. We get so familiar in routines on a day-to-day basis that we become numb at the very things that we do on a day-to-day basis many of the time. Every year Christmas rolls around and we got the trees, we got the ornaments, we got the lights, we got the shopping, we got our little shopping trip, we got the cards, got to put out the cards, make sure you get the pictures done. We're running a little behind in my household on the cards, but they're going to get out. It's going to happen. It's part of what we do at Christmas time. And oh yeah, in the story of Jesus, we know it was about Jesus' birth and we know the real meaning of the season and we love Jesus and we become we become numb to what is actually implied by jesus the son of god being born into the world around us look we have a tendency to actually look at characters in the bible thinking man they got it all together they're 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 peachy keen they're not having any problems i mean they're bible characters golly they're holier than thou and and we we look at our world of problems and we can't quite equate them and put them together because we think that they got it all together and we don't i'm gonna tell you right now i'm I'm just gonna i'm just gonna break the ice jump into the life of joseph just for a second and just help you understand something joseph was freaking out I mean, stop and think about this. Like, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a virgin. She's a virgin. We're, we're going to make this happen. This is going to work. This is going to go. Cr-. You're pregnant? Say what? Say what? I, I didn't touch her. He's looking at daddy. He's like, I didn't, I didn't have nothing to do with that. I don't know what's going on. And he's all of a sudden, he's like, I don't know what to do. And he's, he's freaking out. And all of a sudden, he's thinking about all, what everybody's going to think and what everybody's going to say. And he's like, oh, my gosh, she, she's not only going to die, but like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look like an idiot. I'm going to look like a moron. Joseph is freaking out. He is not handling this well. Men, if you hear that your woman is pregnant and it didn't happen by you, you would freak out too. Okay? I'm just saying. You'd be like, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you didn't. And you'd be finding the best lawyer and you'd be going to town. Well, that's kind of what he was doing. He's just trying to be quiet about it. He's like, hush, hush, I got to find underground divorce attorney or something and uh, so joseph is absolutely freaking out and the one thing that holds them together 
The one thing that holds them together is what is promised by the angel in his dream. The promise the angel delivers is that the Messiah that people have been waiting for for years and years, thousands of years, the foretelling of a coming of a Messiah is who is in the womb of his soon-to-be wife. Oh, man, could you imagine just being confused about this whole, I don't know about this. And then all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord says, no, 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 no. You probably more blessed than anybody else because you get to raise the Son of God. I could imagine him being a little bit more accepting of this. But Emmanuel does mean God with us. And that was the very thing that was going to happen. And it set Joseph's mind at ease. Do you know what God longs for more than anything else that he has, he has done or created? God longs more than anything else to be with his people. God longs to be with you. God longs to be with his people. So much so that in the beginning of creation, God desired to be with the created mankind. It says that he walked in the garden with Adam. He knew us. God desperately desired to have community and to be with us. And then sin entered into the world. And the element of sin is the very divider between us and God. And when sin stepped in and, and it jacked up our relationship with God, God still pursued mankind. Adam and Eve, where are you? Why are you hiding? I desire to be with you, but you have put a wedge in our relationship. God's original desire was to be with us in the very, very beginning. His desire is to be with you. You have to know that. In Exodus, God sends Moses to lead his people who are in slavery and captive and away from him into the wilderness. And although it's kind of a crazy place to take people to get, you know, build a relationship. Hey, baby, want to go out? We're going to hang out. We're going to get to know each other. Let's go to the desert. Yeah, I don't know what, you know, he had some thinking and all that. But I think getting people to sometimes a dry land, a place without water, to where your, your, your mouth is parched for something to drink, you have to have that need met. And I think that that was a great place for God to quench the thirst of his people by being in the presence of him. So much so that he led Moses to lead him out into the desert. And here they are. Now all of a sudden, God is starting to strategically give them guidance as to how they can build their relationship with him. So much so that we now have the word of God that instructs us how we can have a relationship with God. And I think the coolest thing in all of that is this. I, I mean, this is kind of weird that I'm randomly throwing in the tabernacle. And some of you are like, what the heck is a tabernacle? And I'm like, it's not a shed in the back that you keep tools in, y'all. I'm just saying. Um, the tabernacle was, uh, God gave specific instruction to his people on how to build the tabernacle. You want to know where the tabernacle was placed in the midst of God's people? Right smack dab in the middle. And it symbolized his presence. He was in the tabernacle. He was in the center of God's people. And that is where God desires to be with us, is in the center of our lives. Because when he is in the center of our lives, it is about our relationship with him and not everything else in the world. What separated God's people from the rest of the world was that God was with them. Oh, man. What should separate us from the rest of the world is that we are with God and that God is with us what god has always wanted and it's what's what you and i have always needed is for god to be with us we we are built into being eternal be beings and, and that comes with an internal desire to long for something bigger than ourselves there isn't a single person in here when you step out of high school that you didn't long to have that career or that job or that business or that degree or, or that missional involvement. Whatever it is for you, we long for something bigger than what we are. And so often when life brings in its trials and its tribulation, we find stuff that almost takes power over us in the wrong ways and sometimes in the good ways. We long for things. We long for things bigger than ourselves. And that is God. God desires us to long for Him because He's promised us that He is with us. 
But the problem is that we try to fill that longing with all the wrong stuff. And Christmas time is a total revealer of that. As we roll over into January and we're regretting the money that we spent and the travel that we did and the things that we... All of this stuff that we think matters the most when in reality God just wants you to know Emmanuel. God is with you. He longs for you. We, we think that there's going to be this great satisfactory life fulfillment when we give that person this one gift. That one gift is going to make them complete. Or if we get this one thing on our list that we absolutely want, this is going to make me happy. And it's, it's going to fulfill who I am and what I am. If I spend all of the money that I have on this, or, or they spend all of their money on me, or all of these things are going to make me happy. Cars, I'm going to tell you, break down. And that, they will not sustain fulfilling happiness for you. Relationships break relationships are sometimes hard to mend and i'm not saying that we're not supposed to long for and make our marriages work and our relationships with our children and our family and our friends work but i'm saying they will fail you there's not a present that you're going to get this this year that won't maybe wear out maybe get lost get broke but i can tell you a love that will never never fail you is the love of a father the love of a heavenly father So, the angel gave the big announcement to Joseph, right? He's like, simmer down now, Joseph. It's okay, man. She didn't go out on you or nothing like that. It's just the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about it. And you're going to name him, and his name is going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And all of a sudden, Joseph's like, oh. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do there for a second. I was freaking out. I was like, man, I was about to drop her like a hat. Um, I know that you're saying, just sitting here, like, I know that Emmanuel means God with us. I know that God is with us. Then why are you stressed out? If you know that God is with you, then, then, then why do you think that the world is falling apart around you? Why do you think if your one circumstance doesn't work itself out, the end of the world is near? Why do you think that if you don't pass that final that final exam that your life's destiny is not going to be worked out god is with me and why why is maybe your marriage on the rocks or relationships that you have are on the rocks god is with me though you don't think the gift why do you think that the gift you're going to give or the the one that you're going to receive is going to bring fulfilling happiness god is with me though God is with me. If we know this, then why don't we live this? If we know that God is with us, then why doesn't it show in the way that we live out our lives? What seems to be crashing down in our lives is a direct response to what we're actually believing about God. We view our problem as big, and sometimes we act out that our God is little, and it's backwards. Because our God is bigger than any problem that you're ever going to face, than any circumstance that you're going to embrace, anything that has you discouraged or depressed. What if the thing that drove you this Christmas wasn't all about the stuff, wasn't all about what the culture shapes us to be? What if it was a deeper desire to be in the presence with an almighty God? who sent his son Jesus into the world to be with us. You see, we're one up on Joseph. Joseph didn't see all that was going to happen, but we know the whole story. We know that Jesus is not only with us, but he lived for us. He died for us. He rose from the dead. He gives us life. He's gone and he's at the right hand of the Father, but he has sent the Holy Spirit into each and every one of us he doesn't just have to dwell in the tabernacle to be in the center of god's people where we have to come to him no 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 each one of us can find our rest in him i want to i want to just shortly look at two 
events, two little things right here in this scripture that radically changed and transformed Joseph's life. The truth is, the more that you become aware that God is with you, your life will change. The more that you embrace and experience God's presence, your life will change. If you're not experiencing the presence of God, you are lonely in some area of your life. The first thing is, is uh, if I become more aware of the, of the fact that God is with me, I care less about the opinions of other people. Look at what verse 19 says. Verse 19 says, Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Hang on. What steered the decision that Joseph was getting ready to make? Shame on what other people thought. He was ashamed of what other people thought of him and of her and of their life circumstance and situation. Can I help you with something, y'all? Those of you who are in school, I don't care if it's elementary school, junior high, high school, or college, you deal with a large amount of peer pressure to fit in, to wear the right clothes, to, to smell the way that you're supposed to smell. I don't know. Uh, 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 drive what you're going to drive. The way that you're seen, the way that you're viewed, what phone you have, how you talk, the, lingo, the, the wording that you say, what sports you're involved in, all of this peer pressure could even be along the side of, hey, use this, hey, do this, hey, say these things. The peer pressure is overwhelmed. Let me fill you in on something. When you become an adult, it doesn't change. There's still a whole lot of peer pressure. There's a lot of peer pressure. It's still peer pressure to wear the same stuff, to drive the right car, for people to know my lifestyle or to know my relational status or my, my situation in my church or whatever the case may be. And everybody's trying to hide something. Why? Because of shame. Because they're under the, mic, they're under the glass of, of how people see them all around them. Living in fear of what other people think about you. If you want to live a life of complete insignificance, live it for the opinion of other people. I'm going to say it one more time. If you want to live a life of complete insignificance, live it for the opinion of other people. But once I see that God is with me, God is for me, and that I am in desperate need of Him, then the opinions of other people are just that. They're only opinions. What God says is truth. What people say is their own opinion. And God's truth trumps people's opinion. The second thing is this. If I became more aware that God is with me, then I'd know my life is under control. If I became more aware that God is with me, then I'd know my life is under control. And I can tell you right now that Joseph was freaking out. I'd have been freaking out. Verse 20, it says this. I mean, stop and think about it. Here he is freaking out and the angel of the Lord had to address it. You know what I'm saying? So he's like, but, uh, but after he considered this, divorcing his wife shamefully because he was freaking out about people of the uh the angel of the lord appeared to him in a dream joseph son of david this is the first thing he says joseph son of david let me get your attention i know who you are do not be afraid why would he look at him and say don't be afraid because he was scared he was scared about his life circumstances he was scared about his future he was scared about how things were going to work out he was freaking out how many of you know someone who absolutely freaks out all the time? Like how many of y'all know somebody in your life that is like absolutely freaking out about everything all the time? <laughs> how many of you just thought of someone other than yourself? Because we freak out over so much. I, at the heart of people freaking out, some of y'all look at a pastor standing up in front of you. And think, man, that guy's got it all together. He preaches to us. He teaches us. He's living it right. He's doing what needs to be done. He's doing what needs to happen. I'm going to tell you something. If you want to meet somebody who freaks out about a whole lot of things, follow me home. Follow me home. Just spend, spend a day or two with me. I freak out about a lot. My wife would testify to that we sometimes think that we've traded places that I'm like the woman and she's the man or something because <laughs> I freak out so much. 
I mean, we think that pastors have it easy because they're the upfront face of a congregation or a people. But behind the scene, I struggle and I freak out about a lot. How things are going to run is the you know just on a sunday morning is the powerpoint going to work is the music going to go well are we going to have sound issues is everybody's timing going to be here how many people are going to be here is kids gonna is everything okay in the back you know or what are people thinking about us how how are things going what are people saying in the community how's the light of christmas thing going to work out how are we going to survive at home (laughs) yeah i don't and then that's just church but then we have our children and schools and life of a baby and I have other family issues and if you ain't met my family, we're jacked up people. Spend a day with me. Joseph wasn't above being one who freaks out. I am not above somebody who freaks out and I carry a lot of weight all a lot of the time. This last week I was called on to preach my first funeral i've been at this ministry thing for about six seven years and i got to preach my first funeral this week and i'm not celebrating i'm not it's a funeral for a baby who died just a couple days before its birth it causes a person to ask a lot of questions the whys and the what's and seeing the Look on the mother's face standing there as the casket is going into the hole. Her younger brother actually dug the hole and buried his nephew. The father just has no idea what happened. There. We have a lot in this world to freak out over. but it does reveal something it reveals it reveals that we desperately need him to be with us we you i we can't do this thing we call life on our own it's when we try to that we fill that little void in our heart in our soul in our lives with all of the wrong things and things that aren't eternal, things that don't last. Christ is eternal, and he made us as eternal beings. So when we try to put things in our heart that are temporary, they die, and we die with it. If we, this Christmas, were to take a step back, and not freak out, but just pursue God, even when we don't want to, and I'm not going to lie, I've had to, there is a peace that comes with it there's a peace that surpasses my understanding to know that i could feel like i got the weight of the world on me but i also have a joy inside of me that is well this separates me from the rest of the world because when christ is in the middle of your life you can rest assured he's in control romans eight twenty eight says And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. The easy thing is to believe and rest assured in God. The hard thing sometimes is to live out the calling and to do the things in the midst of things being out of whack that God desires you to do. Because sometimes that's just hard. In this last... In this last... uh, couple weeks as i've had a lot of freak out moments my wife has been so good to me well i've had a lot of my freak out moments i found myself getting lost in the psalms i actually read psalm 139 for the funeral and uh, psalm 140 141 142 those are all just those are prayers of david going up to god in desperation for help and for guidance and for direction and prosperity and so on and so forth in the midst of life and, and I have found a lot of warmth from these scriptures. But I want to read to you Psalm uh, 139, uh, 13 through 16. It says this, For you created my inmost being. 
You knit me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'm telling you this morning, you've got to know that God knit you together in the womb of your mother, and you can praise him because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says, the guy says, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. God, your works, you don't make junk. I'm not junk to you, God. I feel that way sometimes because I fill myself up with junk. But when you are in the center of my life, I feel valued. I feel purposeful. I feel loved. Verse 15 says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Father, you knew me when nobody else did. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You know what that says to me? That says to me in the days that I don't have it figured out, the days that I don't understand the complicated circumstances that I'm living through, God has the master plan. He's got the blueprint of your life. He knows why you're going through that day for the other day. He knows why you're facing the circumstances. I don't have the answers for the weight that you're carrying, but I know the one who does, and he is Emmanuel. God with us. If you desire to see your marriage radically changed, then pursue the presence of God in your whole life. If you desire to see your parenting take the next level, then pursue the presence of God with everything that you have in you. If you desire for loneliness and depression to fall at the wayside in your life, I'm telling you then you need to pursue the presence of a living God. If you desire for your church to change, understanding your purpose to change, or your anxiety to change, I'm telling you, you need to pursue the presence of God and put God in the middle of your life and of your heart, and I'm telling you, those things will change. You can't fill your life with the things that are going to rust away and die because you'll do the same thing with it. But if you put an eternal God in the midst of your eternal life, you will live and have life and have it abundantly. Do you really realize the addict, the one who is pursuing all of these things to fill its, its life and its body with? Well, it's powerful. And it has power to control your life and the way that you think and the way that you act and the way that you conduct yourself. But it does not have power over God. And when you die, your addiction dies. But you can be set free by putting Christ in the center of your life. For the poor person who doesn't have the money, who doesn't have the home, who doesn't have the furniture, who doesn't have the car, who doesn't have the job, they're pursuing something and many of them don't even know that it's God. For the middle class person who seems to be comfortable in the life that they're living or for the rich person who has everything, they are still pursuing something greater than themselves, not knowing often that it's God. So my challenge for you today is this. Ryan, man, if you'll, if you'll come up and play. My challenge for you is this. This Christmas, if you so desire for your life to have radical impact, radical change, and to be focused on all the right things, I'm going to tell you that we need to be obsessed with being in the presence of an almighty God. That we need to commit ourselves on this day to pursuing the very person and the very characteristics of who God is. To embrace the fact that he laid down his life for you. To embrace the fact that he desires to be with you and has before he ever formed you in the womb of his mother. And he promises you like he promised Joseph, Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with you. Jeremiah, how? How do I pursue that? I'm telling you, there's a lot of people claiming a whole lot of different things to be truth. But rest assured, when you're listening to the voices of the world, you're going to listen to what they amplify as truth. But when you're listening to the truth of God's holy, inerrant word, you're listening to the voice of God. Be careful and cautious, oh God's people. 
to blend yourself into the world and try to make it the mattress in which you lay on. Rest your heart and your eyes on the Word of God and your life will change. You will hear and discern the voice of a living God if you fill your mind and your heart with His holy and errant Word. I want to challenge you in whatever way, shape, or form. You can get online. You can get apps for it. Bible reading plans are more accessible now than at any other time in the history of man. Getting into the Word of God is as simple as opening it up and starting somewhere. I recommend the New Testament. Shoot, you can start in Matthew and read right through the Christmas story and keep on trucking from there. Matthew likes that. Matthew says, I'm reading Matthew. We got a guy named Matthew here. The Word of God speaks. If you would this morning, bow your heads. Bow your heads, close your eyes, humble your hearts. I don't do things like this often, but I'm going to this morning. I feel, I feel the Holy Spirit is tugging. I feel the Spirit of God dealing with some hearts right now. You're sitting here this morning and you're like, you know, I've been filling my life with all kinds of stuff and I know that it's not been God. I come into the Christmas season and I'm the one who's depressed. I'm the one who's confused. I'm the one who's struggling and I feel the weight. I want to enjoy it. I want to embrace it, but I don't really know that real joy. That's because you don't have Jesus at the center of your life. And you know without a shadow of a doubt that in this moment right now, if you were to die, that you'd spend eternity in hell just as dead and broken as the things that you're trying to put into your life. And you need a touch from God and you need Christ to save you. If that is you, would you just slip your hand up just for a moment saying, today I need to allow God to have my life. Amen. Amen. For those who just said, yeah, that is me. That is me. I'm, I'm far from God and I need God to have all of me. I want you to pray something like this. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner, and my sin has separated me from you. God, I desire for you to have all of me. Forgive me of my sin, and my brokenness, and my shame. Set me free, and save me, oh God. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you lived, that you died, that you rose from the dead and today have given me life. And I thank you in Jesus' name. For the rest of you, keep your heads bowed. You have a weight that you've been carrying and you often find yourself filling the void with so many other things. And you know without a shadow of a doubt that you are not pursuing God the way that you need to be pursuing God, that you're not living a life that is saying God is with me and you desire to would you just slip your hand up? Say, I desire to live like God is with me. Amen, 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 amen. That's more than half the room. Maybe the whole room. Heavenly Father, in this moment right now, with so many hands being raised to the heavens, I can almost say, I'm not the only one who freaks out. For the ones who are sitting here that sometimes feel alone, feel like they're freaking out all on their own they're not God I just ask you to cleanse our hearts and our minds and forgive us of our sin and the things that we put that create boulders in between you and us God help us to be solely focused on who you are this Christmas season in our whole lives God help us to pursue you in your word that we could hear your voice and discern the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. God, bring us comfort, bring us joy. Bring us the kind of happiness that's eternal, not just temporary. So we move on from this place today. God, I just pray that we would acknowledge that you are with us. And help us embrace and know that in the way that we act and the way that we talk and the things that we do. Help us to pursue you, God. We are parched in a dry land, and we need the water of life that only you can give us that comes through your Son. 
We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. God is with us. He is in your midst. He is in my midst. And we need to embrace this Christmas knowing that God wants to be in the center. Be careful and be cautious as you leave this place to not set God on the outside perimeter of your life, but put him in the very, very center. And you can do that by quickly getting into his word, getting accountability, having people get in the word with you. We trust that God has spoken to you today. Connection Point Church exists to connect with people who are far from God so that they may be raised to new life in Christ. And we would love for you to join us on this mission that God has given to us. It is through the generosity of partners like you that God allows us to make a difference. Please consider visiting our donation page at www.connectionpoint4u.com. That's Connection Point, the number four, the letter U, dot com. Click on Give and simply follow the instructions on the page. We also completely understand that everyone is not in a place where they can support this ministry through financial giving. So we would ask that you please pray for the life and ministry of Connection Point Church so that we would continue to make connections, see lives changed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and watch this community be built up. Thanks, and God bless.